during our our office hour, we get a few questions about, well, I have a GPU on my laptop, why I cannot use it? So maybe um, it's a good idea to talk about more about hardware and what kinds of hardware for deep learning and how to get uh, fully utilization from this hardware. So let's start with the GPU machine you can get by your own. You can buy a reasonable Intel's CPU, it's i7, it gives you 0 0.15 teflops. You can put a reasonable number of 32 gigabyte DDR4 memories for your machine. And most importantly, you're gonna buy a NVIDIA GPU here. Here we using NVIDIA Titan X. This is a decent GPU. Two years ago, it gave you 12 teflops and 16 gigabyte memory. And you can see that, well, it's give um, more, almost a 10 times more T-flops, which is the computational power compared to the CPU you have. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the CPU. So this is the uh, chip area of the Intel i7 CPU. You can see that on the right, on the right hand, on the left hand, just large area called Intel Processor Graphics. It's actually a GPU. It's an integrated GPU. Um, for your displays, and but this this GPU is pretty weak and have less memory. We usually don't use them for training deep learning. But yes, we can do it for inference. That's a different topic we may not cover today. And on the right hand, you can see that the the blue area um, we have four GPU cores. This is a physic physical CPU cores. And between them, there's a shared last layer, last level cache. It's called L3 cache. Then within each physical CPU, we have a 64 kilobyte L1 cache and 256 kilobyte L3 cache. The shared last level cache, or called L3 cache, is eight megabyte. And the blue area on the right and on the top, this is the interface to main memory. Here we have 30 gigabyte per second to the main memory. Now this is the design of the CPU. Now let's talk about how to fully utilize the CPUs. So for example, if you're going to compute A plus B, both A are just the scalars on the CPU. We need to do a bunch of work before we actually do the computation. Assume both a and B are on the main memory. Then we need to move both A and B into the register on the CPU before computation. The usual way we move the data, we first move A and B into L3 cache, then to L2, to L1, and then to registers. Access the, mem the data in L1 cache is pretty fast. It's almost as fast as your uh, your computation, but to access data in the L2 cache, it's a little bit slower. It's 14 times slower than access for L1. Access the main memory is even slower. It's 200 times slower compared to access L1. Then one trick to improve the CPU performance is that we want to move data as less as possible. So we can call it called memory locality. Usually there's two kinds of memory locality. One's called temporal, one's called spatial. For temporal, which means we can reuse data later uh, from our own so that we don't need to remove the data out from cache. For spatial, which means if we use data in a particular location at memory, the next time we're going to use the data maybe nearby this memory so that CPU can prefetch data for, for me. So let's make a case study here. So soon we have a matrix and matrix is stored in a row major, which means each element in a row is stored um, in a sequential way and then row by row here. So in this situation, accessing, uh, accessing a column is usually much slower than accessing a row. The reason is because 
every time CPU reads 64 bytes, it's called cache, uh, cache 9. So then to read one value, we actually read a bunch of other values in the nearby position. So then for each row, we maybe only need a few uh, cache lines read instead of read one by one. Also, CPU can smartly try to reduce to read the next cache line ahead when it even don't know if it's gonna use it or not. So that we can pipeline the data read and um, data processing so to reduce the uh, access uh, the read performance. But if, if you're going to access by columns, because we don't know how long the row it is, the CPU can both the cache line and the CPU cannot predict where the second element is. It is. So then here we need to make four requests and every time we make a request with the data ready compute and do another request. So it's hard to pipeline all this uh, read and the computations. That's why reading a column is slower here. The second way to improve is that you do multi-threads. So we, we saw that the i7 has four cores, um, but server CPU have more cores. For example, the P3, the largest P3, we have four physical CPUs there and 33 physical cores in total. So to fully utilize the resources, we need to using at least 33 threads. Then to use multi-threading is called a parallelization. That is, we can run things in parallel. One, one trick thing here is that Intel can sort of tell you something called hyper-threading, a threading, which means if you read, um, if you check the CPU info uh, in your system, it maybe tell you, okay, I have eight cores. Actually, you have only four physical cores, and the, the other four is, is just a virtualized cores. So using, so if, if you only have four physical cores, using a thread maybe doesn't help too much, because each core only has a, a shared uh, same register. So the register, because it's computational uh, intensive, uh, the two threads on the same physical cores will fight for these registers. So that is, if you're using multi-thread for in Intel CPUs and you can optimize for dense computations, you only want to using the number of threads e equals to the physical cores. So let's do a case, another case study here on the homework. We show that if I'm going to compute A plus B, both A and B are vector, um, it's much easier, it's much faster to just write C equals to A plus B instead of writing a four Python loop that is using um, iterate over the length of A and do, do one by one. The reason is both. Firstly, the left hand code make n course. Every time it's evoking the back end of you need to pass the Python virtual machines to um, to do the computation and every in working uh, every core, you have a certain amount of overhead. But on the right hand, we only call single time, and then we have only single uh, overhead. On the other hand, the right hand is much easier to be parallelized by writing a C++ operator. For example, in C++, to use the multi-thread, I just want to hint uh, before the for loop that is called using um, OpenMP to automatically parallelize the code. And because every time read i's element of A and B and write to the i's element of C, they are independent to each other. So here we can run things in parallel. So we mentioned two tricks to improve the CPU performance was about memory locality, the one the other thing is about um, parallelization. Let's look at about GPU. So this is of the chip area, kind of the CPU diagram for NVIDIA 10X we mentioned before. It's pretty different to a CPU. 
here is that every uh, green dot is actually a core. And for Titan X, we have over 2,000 cores. Every core is much smaller compared to CPU core. So it has very good uh, asthmatic uh, units, but doesn't have so many control flows. So we can only do sim simple uh, uh, asmet, um, arithmetic operations. And it has a shared L2 cache, a 3 megabyte. It's pretty smaller compared to the CPU caches we have. But differently, it has own GPU memory. The memory bandwidth is pretty large. It's 480 gig gigabyte memory bandwidth into the memory and thus GPU. So given this different ar uh, architecture, improving the GPU utilization is similar to GPU, but also different. Firstly, we, we need to use thousands of threads every time instead of 10 threads. So which means each workload we push into the GPU should be large enough. For example, if we're gonna sum a vector of length of 100, at the most we can use 100 threads. To use a thousand threads, at the least we need the vector to be have thousands of elements on the vector. Similar thing for matrix matrix multiplication. If you're gonna 10 by 10 matrix, then well, nothing you can do. You need at least have hundreds by hundreds matrix size. On the other hand, GPU have less a cache architecture and much smaller cache size, which means memory locality is more important for GPUs. Because GPU, each core is much smaller, GPU doesn't have control flows supported well, uh, which means we cannot have like a web serving system uh, running on GPU because they have a lot of control flows and uh, if the network itself have too much control flows, it maybe doesn't run efficiently on GPUs. Then because GPU is so many different kinds of GPUs here, um, for CPU it's the same, but different model give you almost a similar performance. So we have a simple guideline how if for you to buy a GPUs. So the x-axis is the G-flops. G this is a computational power of a, CPU, a GPU. And the y-axis is the price. It's from Wikipedia. It's not actually pretty accurate. So we put a bunch of GPUs there. And there's two kinds of um, blue cycles and the red cycles. The blue one is the line series uh, G, uh, media GPUs. And the red one is the it's a it's a newer one called 10 series, but the the latest one is called 20. Um, it's even higher. We didn't have that here yet. So what you can see that within the series, the computational power is almost linear linear to the price. So which means it's a good it's a good thing because if you have more um a budget, you can buy more powerful GPUs. And almost like that's linear. But the the uh, the new series is much better compared to the old one. Almost like given the same price, the 10 series can get two times more computation power compared to the 9 series. So which means for NVIDIA GPUs, you want to buy new models. And even within the, um, the 10 series, you can see that 1080 Ti um, it's even uh, given the same price, it gives even higher computation power because 1080 Ti is a newer model on this um, series. So a, a quick summary here is that, well, you want to buy a new model and depending on the budget you have, you can try, um, then you can get the calling computation power from the GPU. So let's do a simple comparison for CPU and over GPUs. And we show two kinds of configuration here. On the right hand, on, on the left hand is the typical way you can, is a typical CPU or GPU you can get. On the right hand is a high end. 
So for CPUs, the number of cores is range from 6 to 64, but for GPUs, it is much higher from 2000 to 4000. Accordingly, the T flops from CPUs um, can be from 0 0.2 to 1, but for GPUs, usually 10 to 100 times higher. But the memory size for CPU could be much higher, up to 1 terabyte, uh, but for GPUs, you only get 32 gigabyte at most currently. So which means we want to be very careful about GPU memory utilizations. Mem the memory bandwidth for CPUs may be smaller, up to 100 um, gigabyte, but for GPUs, because the computational power is so strong, we should use much higher memory bandwidth um, uh, memories for from 400 gigabyte to one terabyte. For control flows, CPUs are pretty strong. It designed for that, but GPUs only for like simple, um, simple mass computations is pretty weak. We showed, we already see that on the first slides, how CPU memory and GPU are connected. Now we can see that CPU are connected to memory with 32 gigabyte uh, bandwidth and GPU has its own memory is pretty fast. But the tricky thing here is that GPU are connected to CPU usually by PCIe, but, um, by PCIe and the latest PCIe we have is give you at most a 60, 16 gigabyte uh, per second bandwidth. Which means you don't want to copy frequently data, uh, you, you don't want to copy data frequently between GPU and the CPUs because the bandwidth limitation, and limitation also copy data out from GPU need a little bit of synchronizations which give you another overhead. So that is, if you train a new network, you want to, if you have a GPU, you want to put the workload into a GPU as much as possible to avoid copy data frequently from GPU to CPU. That will destroy your performance. Well, we only talk about uh, Intel CPU and NVIDIA GPUs, but there are more CPU and GPUs. For example, for CPUs, we have AMD CPUs, um, uh, and Edge and mobile phones, a popular choice is ARM. For GPUs, it's desk, if it's desktop and server GPUs, we have AMD GPUs as, as well, and Intel GPUs, we already showed that on the first slides. Uh, on the Edge, on, on mobile phones, we have a bunch of different GPU vendors, ARM, Qualcomm, and a bunch of others. Well, programming on CPU and GPUs are, li are a little bit differently. For CPU, almost are similar to each other. We can use in C++ or any other high-performance language. And no matter what CPU you have, we usually have mature compilers which can give you performance guaranteed. But for GPU, it's a little bit different. On NVIDIA GPUs, we usually use CUDA to program. It's embedding the C um, interface. It has fun. It, it have a lot of features, and the compiler is mature, the driver quality is good, which means you usually can get very good performance from NVIDIA GPUs. For other GPUs, one choice is we can use OpenCL, similar to CUDA, um, but it's uh, widely available to a bunch of GPUs. The tricky thing here is that for different GPU vendors, the quality varies. Sometimes we Sometimes that a GPU you don't have so much driver, so much good quality driver, which means how no matter how good program you wrote, it maybe runs slower, and also it doesn't have the full tool chain to supporting all the deep learning uh, frameworks, which means running G, running deep learning workload on GPUs instead of besides NVIDIA GPUs sometimes harder, but people are getting better and better to fix it.